Guten Morgen, es ist ein äh, Vergnügen, hier zu sein, äh, aber ich kann nicht äh, äh, weiterfahren, obwohl ich habe äh, in der Schule gelernt, ich habe keine Übung. <lacht> um, in many ways, I, of course, I, um, in many ways, I should have gone before Jeremy, um, and I hope to at least compliment what uh, Jeremy has said and um, <coughs> throw some light on, on some of the things that he opines on. <coughs> in particular, as you will see from this slide here, down at the old tank and spigot, it's making the point that Jeremy made that the tar sands may be very large but the rate, in fact, I think it's wildly overstated personally, but, I, but the rate is uh, a limiting factor. I, I'd be surprised if it gets to two and a half million barrels a day, personally. So uh, the, the first picture was Chavez and Morales of Bolivia. Sorry, thanks, thanks. Uh, can I get a glass of water too, please? Thanks. Um, and uh, this, this is our friend Mugabe. And um, it, they both make the point that uh, there may be resources out there, but you can't get at them of hydrocarbons. And um, a point that Ewan has made a number of times is that exports fall a lot faster than production. So let's just have a look at uh, world energy consumption. Uh, let's establish a few basic uh, points uh, to some observations. First of all, uh, the world's energy consumption is moving along at 2% per annum increase, as it always has. Um, oil stalled a little bit, but uh, gas is moving up, and the largest increase over the last few years has been in coal, um, <coughs> surprisingly. So I don't know where this comes out. Okay, so I tried to look at where we are in world oil production and liquids. So the, the darker line is crude, black oil, and the lighter line includes uh, NGLs and natural gas plant liquids, which is a slightly deeper cut. In the blue line there is the, the oil price, and you can see that there is absolutely no price response whatsoever. And to me, that looks like a system that is absolutely tight. I would say there is no spare capacity. If there was spare capacity, it would have gone up in 2008. So let's look at some countries, and in particular, um, the surprising one is the yellow. United States is increasing a little bit, and very importantly, what's going on in Saudi Arabia, which I'll, I'll come back to that. But what has been uh, going on in, in the recent past is this increase in... Uh, natural gas liquids, because of the increase in LNG uh, and a lot of liquids come with the frac gas in America, uh, we're getting um, an increase of about half a million barrels a day of liquids in the US and about 200,000 barrels a day from Saudi. Now I'll just touch on some basic points. We know all these already. The oil fields in the world are in very strange distribution. There are very few, very large ones, and they, that's where the bulk of the oil is. <coughs> However, all oil fields decline. Here are some of the biggest oil fields in the world, and they all show that they, they stay on plateau for a little while and then uh, decline exponentially. So here's the latest uh, member of the uh, family, to use Jeremy's words. Uh, this is Norway. It was a very important oil producer, still is. But you can see it's uh, declined from th just over 3 million barrels a day in 2000-ish. And uh, by 2010, it's down to 1.8 million barrels a day. Notwithstanding the large discoveries you'll see further on the right on the chart there, there's no getting back to the peak. This is a 7% decline, which doesn't sound alarming, but it is. So this is the picture that we uh, all started with. The world's demand goes up, but fields de decline. So there's an 
uh, ever-increasing need for new oil capacity or the price of oil goes up. This capacity, uh, by 2020, uh, in this case, 2010 to 2020, 2020, we're going to have to replace half the world's oil supply capacity. So this is the tank and spigot type argument. Um, conventional black oil has reserves of 750 million to uh, a, a, th a thousand million, a billion, uh, sorry, a trillion, that should be a thousand rather than a hundred, 750 to a thousand billion barrels. So at 7% decline, that's 50 to 60 million barrels per day per annum. What, can, you know, what other ways are there to make up this uh, decline? NGLs, natural gas liquids, five to 10. US made probables, maybe two, yet to find, maybe four, et cetera, et cetera. In particular, bitumen, I'm being very generous, might get to six million barrels a day. Shale oil, maybe five to 10, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But the point is, there's no way that any of these uh, less conventional sources are going to offset decline from the main fields. Pursuing this thought, What's happening in Saudi? This is the, the most critical uh, idea. And in particular, the biggest field in the world, Gawa, what's happening at Gawa? And I point here to the, on the top right, uh, I'm not sure how to do this. Anyway, the top right is uh, Abcake. And uh, it's a similar geological um, setting to the north half of the, the Gawa field. And there's Abcake. It looks exactly like all the other fields. It uh, peaks and then declines irreversibly. So it's very hard to get to the bottom of what's happening in Saudi Arabia. So you can only clutch at straws. So the blue line, the darker line, that's not the darker brownie line there, is the black oil and it's the line we should be looking at. The top one includes liquids, million barrels a day or so, very slight increase. But the black oil will tell you the fate of Gawa. So these two lines I put on here are 7% decline. So from about 2009, it looks as if Saudi uh, production has stabilized, but it's not true. In that period, post-2009, they brought on new 2 million barrels a day capacity, uh, the biggest of which is Kures, uh, and that's 1.2 million barrels per day. And that has lifted uh, or effect effectively kept their Saudi output flat. But there is nothing else in the pipeline. There is uh, the Kuwait, the neutral zone with Kuwait, uh, an expansion coming. But I was talking to some Kuwaitis. They said that's no, no time soon. And there's a heavy oil field in the offing 2013 maybe. So, so this imminent decline of Saudi is still with us. I put this for interest. This is a picture for those so inclined of Sheba. This is one of the major new fields to come on in Saudi Arabia. And as you can see, it's in the empty quarter. If there was any, any easy pickings nearby, nobody would ever go to Sheba, as you can see. I, I want to um, just draw, really draw your attention to this, this middle uh, chart here. And you can see um, this, this is a north-south section of Saudi Arabia. And you can see it's, a, it's the simplest geology on Earth. It's layer cake geology. What they did historically is drill the bumps. So you can see that the, the two major bumps are Gawa... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, okay. Okay, so the, uh, these, these, yeah, these two bumps, this is Gawa and that's Zubair. Uh, exploring in Saudi was very, very easy. The trouble with it being very easy, there's no complexity, and if there's no complexity, there's nothing hiding around that uh, you, know, you haven't found just yet. I'd also point out uh, this. This is all uh, basement, no prospectivity. Fact, prospectivity is quite limited in area. My point being is they're not suddenly going to explore and find more in Saudi. And in fact, uh, the, uh, here you have a, a chart. 
that shows Saudi's production, but at the bottom, the dark line, is the consumption. They're now consuming 3 million barrels a day. So Saudi's export capacity, given the decline plus the, the consumption, their export capacity is challenged. I now want to take a look at shale gas and shale oil. The, the, don't worry about all the notes on there. It's a complex issue, is, is the point. Those, the, all those uh, chemicals are uh, hydrous aluminium silicates, and they make up uh, s some parts of clay. So if we look at the major um, shale deposits of the world, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the U.S., this is possibly the most favored uh, hydrocarbon basin in the world. It had uh, shallow seas for a long time, very, very good for producing shale. Other good shales that I know about, uh, Neuken Basin in Argentina, Canning Basin in Australia. The rest, according to second-hand, this is, uh, is not very good. Um, Pol Polish uh, work on shale gas has been negative. And uh, I talked to an expert in the field. He said, Polish gas is the, big, the best shale in Europe. And he said, it's like being the tallest kid in grade three. It doesn't mean anything, because the rest's so bad. So, right. <coughs> uh, this is a little technical bit uh, for Jeremy. Shale is, is a, a grain size description, not a mineralogy. And in fact, against, probably against expectation here, all the major shales are dominantly either silicates or uh, carbonates. The clay, V clay, is uh, an adverse feature and has to be as low as you can, um, sort of 10% and lower. Otherwise, you can't frack it. it. It becomes too ductile. So V clay is bad. I just put this in for... Those who haven't seen it, what people do is they drill horizontally and they have multi-stage fracks. Here's a 10-stage frack. These are getting pretty huge. Um, the, a typical well will use 5 million gallons of fluid, 400 tons of chemicals, 200 tons of propants. So, and, and that's to produce trivial amounts of uh, hydrocarbons. I put this in just for, this is post-frac, what has happened, and they're looking about slick water fracks versus nitrogen fracks, but you can see that things frac perpendicular to the major stress. This is really for Jeremy and his classes. Um, the other thing, I, this, I won't go through all the properties. These are fam famous uh, shale places, and the Eagle Ford is the, is the most interesting. But the properties here are not the properties that you'd uh, normally deal with. Um, there are things like Brunel hardness, i.e. can you frack, frack it, permeability in nanodarcies. So th this is, we, we, we deal in, if we get 100 millidarcy or a darcy, we're happy. Nanodarcies in the past, we wouldn't even look at it. So the point is, we are now lo looking at the source rock, not migrated to reservoirs. So when the source rocks produce oil, they sort of burp the hydrocarbons, and normally that would migrate. But in the case of shales, you need a seal and you get overpressure. So a good shale, um, uh, likely to be productive, it has good seal, not fractured, and uh, overpressured. <clears throat> this is a picture of IP, initial production rate, uh, for the first four months, uh, in MCF per day, um, over 70 wells drilled by Shell. Shell put a lot of energy and technical expertise into this, and guess what? Nothing. There is no learning in this chart at all. So they, for sure, haven't twigged what the hell's going on in, in the, uh, their shale drilling. I've got lots of charts. I just thought that like this, but Shell's big enough so that they, you know, they can take a few hits like that. But, but, the, but this, this is quite staggering. So by, well, you know, 60, they're still drilling uh, wells that aren't producing. So this is what's happened in the U.S. Uh, on the bottom, well, the, the bottom line looks at the gas price, and it's fallen away from its peaks of 10-ish down to 2. And uh, the, the gas rig num uh, count has fallen from 1,200 to 400. 
But the gas is staying up because it's an involuntary byproduct of oil production. So let's have a look at shale oil. Rigs chasing, this is a different scale, so this is only 200 rigs chasing oil against 400 still going on gas. <coughs> um, but to Jeremy's point, I just want to put the barken on one side. This barken's not a shale. It's a silty, low productivity reservoir. But you see, it could get to a million barrels a day by 2015. Lots of people get rich, but it doesn't matter. <coughs> and this makes the same point again. Now I want to look at the Eagle Ford. This is really extraordinary. Uh, you can see, uh, OK. This is the dry gas window. This is a condensate window, a wet gas, as it were. And up here is the oil industry and a, a oil window in the source rock. And against all expectation, these wells are flowing black oil out of shales. And uh, you immediately get how do these molecules f flow in shale. Uh, it's very difficult. I'll just see what I've got here. Wait a minute now. Um, so this is a typical uh, Eagle Ford well. It comes on at 250 uh, barrels a day, and it declines. Um, by, at the end of the year, it's 50 barrels a day, so it's gone down by a factor of five. And I said, well, let's say uh, oil, they're getting $100 a barrel, make it easy. By, by the, this, on this chart, they've earned five and a half million dollars. Assume, you know, assuming they don't have any costs. The, the wells are costing eight million dollars. So this is, this is an uneconomic game at the moment, except for the outliers. So if you remember that scatter of IPs, in initial production, um, the, the good ones pay for the bad ones, but on average, they don't pay for themselves. So this is people are trying to work out what's going on, and they really don't know. But here you see on the right-hand side near the bottom, typical shale reservoirs. And they're saying, well, it's possible that at least simpler, smaller oil molecules are still able to move in micropores, micropore throats, and fractures in the shale. Here's an another picture of IPs, uh, and, and you can see all over the place, no um, sign, no, they haven't cracked it. And it's the good one, good ones that have to pay for the bad ones. So, so much for US energy independence. This oil uh, revolution has halted decline, which is staggering. But it's not, it's not uh, going to change the world very much. And here's a picture by the uh, US uh, EIA and you can see that even they, lower top brown thing, lower 48 onshore tight oil, maybe a million barrels a day. Seeing that the US consumes 18 million barrels a day, they're still importing 10 million barrels a day no matter what. Sometimes <coughs> people say, um, you know, well, well, can Europe do this? Well, I don't think so. If you look, this is, this is a picture of the... Um, Barnett shale area. Now, can you see a very good shale is the Paris Basin. Can you see this happening in the Paris Basin? I don't think so. <laughs> and this is, a, I thought, I had thought you want to produce this chart, a chart, but, but somebody did. If you look at the energy efficiency of these new ways of uh, trying to extract hydrocarbons from the rock, you can see that the energy return on energy invested is going downhill very fast. And normally that would come out in uh, economics. That So if your EROI gets down to one, you know, you're putting as much in as you get out, should be uneconomic, at least if you, if you want to m make a margin. And I think the story of all those IPs in initial production rates all over the place is saying, really, this is uneconomic activity, on average. So now, here's my outlook, and Jer Jeremy would like this, I think. This, this makes the point, uh, since 1950, the Egyptian population has gone from 20 million to 80 million. 
Can you believe it? That's, that's extraordinary to 2010. And what's, what's happened to their um, oil? So the black, well, let's look at the green. The green was their export. So in 1990s, Egypt was a very good, strong balance of payments, um, selling their oil. As the black line consumption went up, uh, so the export went down until by 2010, no more Egyptian exports. Uh, so that their balance of payments is in big trouble. Um, and who knows? I, my thesis is that this is part of the reason why we saw all the Tahrir Square and all the rest of it. So in my mind, uh, high oil prices lead to recession. And this, this is a chart, I, again, I may, may well have got it from the oil drum, I can't remember. But if it says that if the price of energy gets towards 6 or 7% of GDP, you're in recession. And it's my thesis that energy runs normally 4 or 5% of GDP. If for exogenous reasons it doubles 5 to, 5 to 10%, you suddenly are running a 5% current account deficit and, and your uh, debt starts skyrocketing, skyrocketing for nothing that you've done. And I believe this is quite a telling point. So I tried to look at this this is the energy import dependence of the 11 largest data from EIA. Nowhere could I find data of the percent of GDP spent on uh, energy. And I, I tried to work out. It's, it's 5, 6, 7 percent. But it, here you see the energy de uh, dependent uh, countries. Italy, Spain, Germany, Japan, Korea. All of these countries are going to be in trouble and we know Italy, and I, these are only the big ones. There are lots of little ones, too, that I didn't bother with. But um, you can see how exposed uh, Italy, Korea, Japan, Spain, Germany a little bit, uh, are to uh, energy prices. Conversely, there's Canada, Australia, Saudi, and so on, who, who are the other side. <coughs> so here I've plotted um, population in the brown bars, and energy consumption in the yellow per capita. And of GATA and UAE, we don't have to worry about too much. Canada and US, they're big, they're cold, you can understand. Saudi is profligate, coming in from the right. But let's say the India and China want to consume oil at the same rate as Greece. Now that's a pretty modest uh, requirement. Uh, however, that requires a new 120 million barrels a day. I uh, suggest that's never going to happen. So, what's, uh, and then along with the uh, top left oil price five times, we've got copper, corn, soybeans, wheat, feeder cattle, all going up, all squeezing the individual, all squeezing economies. So, this is my projection for what happens. Um, this is GDP per head, 2009 purchasing power parity. Uh, top is the US, yellow, just underneath is Japan, and you can see that they're riding high on the hog up until 2009 or so. And at the bottom we've got uh, in, uh, India and China crawling up the curve. So what happens uh, going forward? I'm suggesting because of the increasing energy prices, the hidden costs in foods, energy intensive industries and so on, that the big, and this is a logarithmic scale, the uh, big rich countries will uh, go in decline, the rise of India and China will be stunted somewhat and will by some undisclosed time in the future um, will converge. The population of China is at least three times out of the US, so China will be the largest economy by a long time, by a long way. Okay, so that's my take, the, the end of my talk, and the end is nigh. Thank you very much. <laughs>